The following is a special presentation of PBS Hawaii. Major funding for the following special has been provided by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, working for all Hawaiians. Two worlds collide. A 19th century Hawaii is shadowed by uncertainty. Control of the islands is at stake as new diseases ravage the population a once thriving society is faced with collapse. You won't find a better story of where the leadership basically tries to step up and is willing to take on all of these new challenges and changes in order to ensure the survival of their people. Na'ali'i rise to claim the future with institutions that will bear their name, bringing education, healthcare, support for children and elders, and above all, opportunity. The concerns that led to the formation of the trusts on many fronts still exist today. Now, these institutions chart new courses toward greater goals. With challenges renewed, build a future of hope upon the values of the past, prized, honored, and respected. Five institutions, unique in our time. Established by Ali'i Nui, high chiefs of old Hawaii for the survival of the Maka'ainana, their people in a world that neither could have foreseen. The Queen's Medical Center, the largest in the Pacific, serving close to a million patients each year. Walunalilo Home, a place of shelter and comfort for seniors. The Kamehameha Schools, education from birth through college to ensure the future of a community. Kapi'olani Medical Center for women and children, specialized care for babies and their mothers. The Queen Lili'uokalani Children's Center, support and nurturing for young people in challenging circumstances. Five institutions exist today because of decisions of a distant past, founded by leaders of government because of needs government could not meet. <laughs> Emma Kaleleonalani Naea Rook, descended from Kamehameha the Great's brother, and wife of Alexander Liholiho, the grandson of Kamehameha and Kalakua. In 1854, Alexander Liholiho was crowned King Kamehameha IV. He was 20 years old. His first message was urgent. The decrease of our population is a subject comparison with which all others sink into insignificance. For our first and great duty is that of self-preservation. Our acts are in vain unless we can stay the wasting hand that is destroying our people. The epidemics are just devastating. I mean, there's severe epidemics. It's really appalling. You can't even begin to imagine the impact of it, you know. People were suffering. The depopulation was abhorrent but how much anyone did about it on a public level, through government, which was in its infancy still, very little. The new government had to cope with economic upheaval, shifting Hawaii from subsistence to capitalism, a money economy. 
from 1840 to 1860, you really don't have a government that has any resources until after 1850 and the land system is complete, then the government emerges with a land base. That's the first time there's a government and it has a land base. When Alexander Liholiho made his plea before the legislature requesting funds for a hospital for natives, um, they simply were unable to help. What he and his queen did is literally go door to door, you know, hat in hand, asking their friends to fund and then go back to the legislature and ask them to match it. The personal appeals from the king and queen raised enough to build the queen's hospital in 1860. It was built on land called Manamana, where King Kalakaua and Queen Liliuokalani had been born. William Charles Munalilo, elected king in 1873, following the death of Kamehameha V. The mother of Lunalilo, Kekauluohi, was a Kamehameha family chiefess. His father was not of high rank. Charles Kanaina was an enterprising Kaukawali, or lesser chief. William Charles Lunalilo, he never married, and uh, his popularity with the people came from how well they got to know him through his mele that were published in newspapers, through his personality, fun-loving. Oh, he was a very brilliant man, but was not given the chance to address, I think, some of the problems that he had identified. Native Hawaiians were being displaced, separated from the land and their traditional lives. They came by the thousands to Honolulu, but too many were untrained for the jobs that were there. Too many had no family support amidst a population decimated by disease. Lunalilo's own health had declined. After a year and a month as king, he died. His will had been drafted by A.F. Judd and left selection of his trustees to the Supreme Court. The court appointed Sanford B. Dole, E.O. Hall, and John Mott Smith. The will gave instructions about what to do with Lunalilo's land. Sell and dispose of the said real estate to the best advantage, and to invest the proceeds in some secure manner until the aggregate sum shall amount to $25,000. They were to use the money to build a home with a specific purpose. For the use and accommodation of poor, destitute, and infirm people of Hawaiian blood or extraction, giving preference to old people. They sold Lunalilo's lands in order to construct and maintain the first Lunalilo home. The first home was built in the Makiki area where uh, Roosevelt High School is and was there for 40 years until they outgrew it, and then the city started encroaching on them, too. It was more of a, a farm-type facility. They raised cows and animals like that. Bernice Hawahi Bishop great-granddaughter of Kamehameha I. Educated, well-traveled, and well-rounded, she was offered the throne by her cousin, Kamehameha V, when he was deathly ill, but she declined. She felt that she could be a better servant to her people by just being who she was. She was just a remarkable woman who understood that without education, there was no chance and hope for her people. Hawahi saw the power of education to awaken her people to their potential in a world of possibilities. They would learn what was needed to ensure their survival. She asked us in particular to pay attention to orphans and pay attention to children from indigent circumstances. Her husband, Charles Reed Bishop, came from New York. In Hawaii, he prospered in business, served the kingdom in government, and on the Board of Education for two decades. 
Pawahi named him as one of the first trustees for her estate, along with Samuel Damon, C.M. Hyde, C.M. Cook, and W.O. Smith. Guided by Pawahi's will, Bishop worked to preserve, not sell, her estate and its hundreds of thousands of acres, about 9% of all the land in the islands. He also contributed millions of dollars to the estate after her death. In 1887, the Kamehameha School for Boys opened with 37 students and four teachers. The School for Girls opened its doors in 1894. <laughs> Esther Julia Kapiolani Napela Kapuo Kakae, a Lee descendant from Kauai and wife of King Kala Kawa elected in 1874 after Lunalilo's death. Together, they faced growing political challenges and the continuing decline of their people. The, the population is not bouncing back because infant mortality continues to be high and, and fertility continues to be low. And this really doesn't turn around until after Kalakaua dies. So that's going to be sort of the ongoing uh, lesson for him. In response, the king and queen proclaimed Ho'olua Ho'ola Lahui to propagate and perpetuate the race. It was both a rallying cry and an organization set up to act to fulfill the call. Under this banner, events were staged and funds were raised with fiery speeches. Our small government is like a ship distressed at sea and the people going to death like flowing water escaping the decks. Therefore, O Maka'enana, seize this time, assist this endeavor to establish among you this association for your own benefit. Kapi'olani had no children and once had given birth to a stillborn infant. That, for her, made issues of maternity and infant mortality even more poignant. She looked into that when she went to New York and to Queen Victoria's coronation in England and she visited hospitals and she came back all fired up. It took her, I think it was 10 years or something, to raise $8,000 to get the hospital started. And, you know, lots of luau's, lots of bazaars, and the way they raised money in those days. In 1891, Kapi'olani Maternity Home opened in a house donated by her sister, Princess Kekaulike. It was located at Makiki and Deritania Streets. Young Hawaiian uh, mothers, who were would-be mothers, uh, were skeptical of doctors and of hospitals, and they didn't know about coming into this place uh, that she she had for them. And you know, it was only after they observed what went on that they kind of started flocking in. The establishment of that hospital, as in the establishment of every other institution, was designed to address yet one more horror that, that the race is going through. Liliu Loloku Walania Kamakaeha born to High Chiefess Keoho Kalole and Chief Kapa'akea at Manamana, where Queen's Hospital was built. Kalakawa's sister, Liliuo Kalani, was recognized as one of the island's most accomplished young women. She was a brilliant student and a talented musician. She had been a guest at the White House and at Buckingham Palace. And during her reign, she stood at the center of a political, social, and economic maelstrom. When she comes to an acceptance of the fact that America is here to stay and we are going to be part of this other government, she jumps into all kinds of um, social welfare programs. As a teenager, she helped Queen Emma fundraise for the Queen's Hospital. As a young woman, she helped Queen Kapi'olani fundraise for the maternity home. And as her final gift, she left her lands for the children of Hawaii. She was a very spiritual person. 
for her, it was difficult not to feel the pain of the, the child who, you know, was struggling to just make a life for him or herself. She wanted to care for those children who otherwise would not be cared for. So in 1909, she originally provided that her trust would care for these children who did not have families to care for them. In 1911, that trust document was amended to care for destitute children, those who are wanting in the necessities of life. At first, the trust was land rich, but cash poor, so money had to be raised. The Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center opened in 1935. The center began as a child welfare program, emphasizing community outreach and participation. At the newly opened Kamehameha Schools, the path to fulfilling Pawahi's mission led to the island of Hawaii and an innovative program with a similar educational purpose. The uh, initial thrust was to create industrious men and women. For the model, Kamehameha Schools went to Hilo Boarding School, the first industrial training school one third of the first class at Kamehameha uh, were made up of boys from Hilo boarding school. Hilo's principal, Reverend William Olson, also came to Kamehameha to run the new school. His watchword was discipline, and he turned to a Virginia Military Institute for inspiration. Olson went to Hampton. He got the idea, oh, they wear military uniforms. Let's make Kamehameha a military school. Then along came Webster, and what he did is he wanted to elevate the educational standards. Then along comes Frank Midkiff, and he thought that uh, what we should do is make this a vocational training school. Along came Barnes, who had his concept of a more preparatory school. The Barnes boys, as uh, I refer to them, they included uh, Senator Daniel Akaka, Dr. Richard Kekuni Blaisdell, and Abraham Pi'inaya, the first director of the Hawaiian Studies Program at uh, the University of Hawaii. The territorial government acquired the Kamehameha Schools campus to build a housing development, a school, and a freeway. So in the 1930s, the school was moved to a new 600-acre campus on Kapalama Heights. While its location changed, its philosophy remained the same. Kamehameha was a military institution. It was a very Western schooling experience. Very little culture. Everything was very regimented. We wore ROTC uniforms every day. We had parades, we had drills. You line up on the field in a uh, uniform, the Bugler Blue Reveille. The uh, fellow tending the howitzer pulled the lanyard. Boom, went the lanyard over, uh, over Kalihi. Uh, the command, the right face was given, and you march into the hall. We had a foundry class, we had electrical class, agriculture. Uh, of course, there were academic classes also, English, math, everything else that goes with a regular school education. They took pride in saying that, you know, by the time you graduated, you already had a job waiting for you. What kind of job? Well, lineman, Hawaiian electric, uh, you know, maybe some metal shop, printing. By the 1940s, thousands had benefited from Pawahi's legacy, but thousands more could not. The estate held 374,000 acres, larger than the island of Oahu, and lease rents from those lands were the main source of income for the schools. Questions began to be raised about how to serve more Hawaiian students. They were questions that would take decades to answer. Pawahi's estate, as substantial as it was, was not the largest. The first trust, Lunalilo's, was in fact even larger, over 400,000 acres. He was the only king who left his, all he had to his people. And when he, when he left it, there was a lot. He had left his estate in the hands of certain executors. They proceeded to go to the court and have the court 
promulgate the sale of his lands, which logically didn't follow that they should do that. One of the justices who made that decision was A.F. Judd, the same man who drafted Luna Lilo's will in the first place. All of the land was sold, and a lot of it was sold for pennies on the acre. And it was just always used to maintain the home. There was no corpus that was built up. I don't think that when Luna Lillo's trust was set up, there was a very good understanding of how important the resources were because his trust was designed to sell property. I've called the taking of Luna Lillo's land, you know, a legal stealing because, and I'm speculating too, that a lot of the lands ended up in the hands or were, quote, purchased very inexpensively by a lot of his own people that he trusted. The possible case of, of something collusive, something underhanded, something less than forthright could be inferred, but I don't have any in evidence to that, to substantiate that truth. In the 1920s, the original building was raised and the home moved to 20 acres in Hawaii Kai. The property was purchased from the Bishop Estate by the E.E. E. family and donated to the Trust. This was the Marconi Wireless Dormitory. We were surrounded by pig farms and flower farms and vegetable farms, and Luna Little Home Road was a dirt road. And um, it was really a serene place to be. Our residents are from all walks of life. Some worked when they were young, others didn't. Uh, we have musicians, we have politicians, we've got everybody. Teachers, we have a lot of teachers. It's interesting to sit down and talk to them about their lives and where they came from and how they were raised and what was life like when they were younger. And just to sit down and talk story with them, it's, it's a it's more rewarding than anything else. Unlike the William Charles Luna Lilo Trust, the Queen Liliuokalani Trust still holds most of the land it started with in 1909. The Queen left to the Trust somewhere between 6,400 and 6,500 acres of land. So we have a very limited asset base that we have to manage to create income in perpetuity. We have 16 acres in Waikiki, we have uh, 3,500 in Kailua Kona, and another 2,800 at Honohina, which is outside of Hilo. Most of our revenue comes from land, which sits under hotels in Waikiki. Land has different character. There are some lands that we have uh, that used to belong to the Queen and were her personal lands. Uh, and ha we have a special feeling for those lands, which we call legacy lands. A lot of Hawaiian culture is tied to the land. You know, selling it is a last resort. The trust has maintained its land holdings to provide stability for the Children's Center's programs. We have nine units statewide, four on Oahu, five on um, the, the neighbor islands. Hi, boys. Our focus continues to be on the orphan and destitute child, um, but we realize these children exist in families, and so we need to also support the family. And then our families live in communities, and we can't always be there to support them, and so we need to have communities that also care about our children and will lend support to them. The services that I use is more counseling. Um, it's more of a ho'oponopono where you bring everybody together and, you know, try to fix things and make it right. Financially, they had helped me with some of the bills that we had fall back on. It's hard when you have, like me, um, lots of kids and they fall ill as well and just, just unexpected things that would happen that would keep you from your job. They make you feel safe. They give for students who don't have school supplies. They provide them. 
and same with clothes and just education to give out scholarships. It's a constant challenge to be flexible enough to meet individual needs in different circumstances for the most fragile and vulnerable of people. That takes resources. And from the beginning, Kapi'olani's maternity home didn't have an endowment nor lands to support it. After Kapi'olani's death, her nephew, Prince Kuhio, and Princess Kalani Anaole managed the home and continued the fundraising luau and parties. The hospital in those days depended solely on fundraising because they didn't charge anybody anything to be in the hospital. Some, quite some years later, they, they, they charged those that could afford it a little bit, and those that couldn't afford it brought fruit and vegetables and, you know. There was talk of merging with Kauikil Lani Children's Hospital, which opened in 1907, but the merger fell through. And in 1929, Kapi'olani Maternity Home built a new facility on Punahou Street. Eventually, though, the two hospitals came together as the Kapi'olani Medical Center for Women and Children. It made sense for the children's center to come together to the women's center because if women are delivering sick babies, uh, it makes sense to have the, the team to take care of them right here in the same institution. So this is the one that records the baby's heart rate. Now we could develop a neonatal intensive care unit that could take care of a lot more than it did before. We developed a transport team, so we started inter-island transports on a formal basis. Uh, and as a result of that, all the subspecialty things that needed intensive care could be developed. Oncology programs, bone marrow transplants, neurosurgery, um, many, 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 many things developed as a result of the two coming together. We want to remind you that we're in the middle of our annual fundraising drive for Kapiolani Medical Center. Fundraising has continued to be an important part of the financial needs of the hospital because reimbursement rates have gone down from the federal government and from payers uh, substantially, and all hospitals are suffering. I think at least 10% of our patients, uh, we don't get paid for it. I, I say at least 10%, and perhaps even more. If someone doesn't have money, they should still be able to be treated. The hospital named for Queen Emma originally was supported by the kingdom government and private donations. It stated its purpose simply and clearly. The reception, accommodation, and treatment of indigent, sick, and disabled Hawaiians, as well as such foreigners and others who may choose to avail themselves of the same. In 1885, Queen Emma died. She left an estate of about 12,000 acres to the Queen's Hospital and a small endowment to the St. Andrew's School for Girls. Queen's Hospital was essentially a national health care system because it was funded by the legislature from year to year. And it continued to be funded even after the monarchy was overthrown. It was funded under the Republic and then in the early years of the territory continued to receive funds from the government. But in the territorial period, the legislature decided that it would no longer fund Queen's Hospital, essentially abandoning this national health care system that had been established under the kingdom. In 1909, the end of government funding brought change to the hospital's finances. In particular, it changed how free health care had been provided to people in need. Queen Emma. She was always um, opposed to American influence and when she ran uh, to be elected as queen uh, against King Kalakaua, she was viewed as the nationalist candidate and the nationalist Hawaiians rallied to her support. So it seems obvious to me that Queen Emma only funded Queen's Hospital because it was providing free health care to Native Hawaiians. Hawaii's congressional delegate joined with Hawaiian civic clubs to file a lawsuit challenging the changes. But the court rejected it, ruling the hospital was complying with Emma's will. The kingdom was not just Hawaiians. It was way beyond that. There were Caucasians and Asians coming on in. And I believe that the intent of the queen and king was for the people of Hawaii at the time. Uh, which was, yeah, a lot, mostly 
Native Hawaiian, but they were also looking to the needs and future needs of, of the other races as well. Looking at those problems we have as, as Hawaiians, ongoing from the times of the establishment of, of the, you know, the National Hospital to now, we, we certainly have not improved. And it's, it's really embarrassing and, and disheartening to see the way things haven't really improved. The statistics are, are known that there's more heart attack, more stroke, more heart failure, uh, more cancer. There's now a renewed effort at Queens to reach out and support partnerships to reverse those long-standing trends. We reassess our Native Hawaiian health strategy. We set about a strategic planning process, a Native Hawaiian health strategies task force, to look at how we could improve in a measurable way and develop a strategy to improve the health and well-being of Native Hawaiians. A $5 million investment helped create the Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the University of Hawaii's John A. Burns School of Medicine. The Queen's uh, health systems decided that this would be a good opportunity for them to put money behind a department that would serve a larger population of Native Hawaiians outside of the hospital campus. Queen Emma's bequest also helped support a clinic open to all regardless of ability to pay. We have a, a nice array of services with uh, great specialists. Every internal medicine resident that uh, basically comes through and I get to influence them, I try to teach them about the concept of aloha. I'm hoping that the resident can observe and get a feel for how to relate to our Hawaiian patients. In 1987, Queen's Health Systems bought Molokai General Hospital, keeping its doors open to serve a rural, mostly Native Hawaiian community. They've been kind of very supportive and Molokai had become the lead in telemedicine services. They've actually um, helped with our research, ongoing research uh, in cardiovascular disease here. They're partners in other kind of cancer research, funding for different uh, health promotion, education, uh, early detection. People look at the position of Queens and those who lead it, and they say you have incredible influence, some would say even power. But the thing is, you know, when I think about it is, how do you use that power and influence in a way that could change just this small part of the world? And for me, it's about knowing that someday, because of our efforts today, that Hawaiians in Hana and in Mililii can say, because of Queen Emma and King Kamehameha, I have the best care. When we can do this, I can go before our King and Queen and say, we have done our very best. And they will say, I. At Kamehameha Schools, meeting the mission of Pauahi's will sparked a debate that lasted for decades. How best to reach the tens of thousands of Hawaiian students in the islands, and what should they be taught? Only 25% of the entire student body were really being prepared to go to college. And I believe it was in the 40s, and maybe even before that, when some alumni was questioning uh, the emphasis on just vocational arts. What about increasing the numbers who are going to college? In the 1930s, President Barnes focused the curriculum on preparing students for college. That brought charges the school was skimming the cream of the crop and ignoring the majority who would benefit most from attending Kamehameha. David Trask Sr. He was a territorial senator and the Democratic Party chairman. And uh, William A. Heen who was uh, president of the territorial uh, legislature. They decided to uh, shake the school up a little bit, these two men. Uh, it had gone very, um, I would say, I wouldn't say elitist, but it was, uh, they were searching for the brightest kids that they could find. 
And, and when I say they could find, these kids were recruited. They're saying, you know, you're just taking the best and the brightest, and that's good. But what about the ones who cannot read in the seventh grade? What about the kids who are homeless? What about the kids who are dropping out? What about pregnant women who don't know how to become mothers? You know, what, 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 what are we doing for them? In response, a national consulting firm recommended several programs to increase the school's reach, including expanding into the community. Kamehameha's extension education program was launched in 1971. We weren't going to be miracle workers, but we were going to be affecting seventh graders at Papakolea, at Nanakuli, at Waimanalo, who were still reading at the third grade, yes. We were going to take our best teachers, put them out there within the DOE arena, and do the best they could with those teachers, and it worked. And so we could not be accused only of taking the best and the brightest. In fact, I had some alumni coming to me personally in corner and saying, Fred, what are you doing taking those kind of kids? My God, they are, they're on drugs, they're on this, this. I said, if we don't do it, who's going to help them? Kamehameha schools eventually ran more than 100 programs through the Hawaii Department of Education. The programs touched almost 32,000 students throughout the state every year. Paying for the schools and programs posed an ongoing challenge for trustees. With statehood in 1959 came an explosion in growth. The lands held by the schools were prime for development and some would say exploitation. Just about every week there was a new high rise going up. You know, this was a period when the landscape of Honolulu changed dramatically. What we were seeing was this transition from the Haole leadership that had run the islands to kind of the more cosmopolitan Democratic Party that uh, represented you know, Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, you know, some progressive Haoles, but it was really a different set of players who had different goals and you know their goals were to maximize development and Bishop Estate was right in the center of that. In 1975, Selim wrote a detailed six-part series for the independent news magazine Hawaii Observer. The Observer series traced land deals to show how developers and not the estate were prospering from Pauahi's lands. One in particular, involving Keoho on the Big Island, was unwound by the probate court, which said it imperiled the future of Kamehameha schools. The way they were leasing land for residential development was never going to generate the funds that were needed to educate all these kids. The Bishop Estate was basically being used by the developers. They would give out master leases and not realize any income or often minimal income from these very valuable leases. The Bishop Estate was not being really run for the benefit of the Hawaiian children who were the beneficiaries. It was being run for the political and economic powers of Hawaii. The result was large tracts of single-family homes sitting on land owned by the Bishop Estate, producing revenue not for the landowner but for the developer. The pressures from growth and development are one set of outside forces that shape the decisions of the trusts. As Hawaii is shaped by social change, the trusts face new issues in fulfilling their missions. The situation for our children and families seems to be getting worse. Um, the drug situation is more out of control. Um, we understand that there are many Hawaiians who are incarcerated. Um, families are struggling to make ends meet financially. When we look at who's there to support our children and families, there are not many people around the table doing that. The whole thing about Queen Lele Okalani is to get her people back on track. Yeah, we, we suffered a lot, we've, we've lost a lot as far as the kingdom was concerned. But there, there is hope. There is hope. And the hope is in our kids. It's about motivation. It's about self-esteem. Experiences are very limited in our community. Here they, they breathe, they eat, 
why at night. Yeah? So we needed to remove them out of that environment and share with the kids the bigger world. So they have that opportunity to make bigger choices. At two upscale Leeward Coast resorts, dozens of Waianae teenagers from the Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center learn to deal with an unfamiliar world at summer internship programs. What we wanted to do is put them in a highly professional environment with some communication training, social skills, customer service, and put them in the hospitality industry and to work with other cultures and to get them to feel good about who they are first. So with working in other cultures, we first identify who they are and they have an opportunity. The more they explain their land, the genealogy of their land, the more comfortable they are with who they are. Uh, how do you like your stand? It's a wonderful They get to see a different group of people and then they begin to see choices in their lives and then they can have those different choices in their lives and they can either choose to continue what they're doing or they can choose things that they see that are totally new and different. It helps me better with my communication skills and not being afraid to go out there and make friends and just to see what other opportunities there are out there for kids. If you're going to create leaders, the leaders have to understand the bigger world and the people in it. So with Marriott and the Beach Club coming forward, it really gave us that opportunity to share the rest of the world with those kids. And hopefully in that process, they'll find their place in the world and we'll help them along to get there. This is our Queen's Ahupua. It's like a pool honoa. It's a place of refuge for our families. This is where they come to connect with each other. They come to connect with their, with their environment. Connection is crucial for Opio from Hawaiian homestead lands in Keaukaha. This has provided opportunities for youth who are having difficulty in school to earn a credit over the summer and to also learn about their genealogy, their history, their sense of place in Kyokaha. At Papawai in Kona, learning also involves hands-on work to restore fish ponds on the Queen's legacy land. Our area here was known for opelo fishing. And at this site here, they utilize the opai ula in their fishing practices. Years ago when we first started this project, it was all filled with mud. And you know, there wasn't any, um, not much water. And so with five gallon buckets and shovels, we got kids out here digging it out and, and reestablishing that environment. And the opai ula come back. They're there and they're just waiting for their house to be cleaned out. And so the kids come out here and they sweat and they're, you know, really hard work. But at the end of the day, you know, it's amazing to see how the group comes together and, you know, laugh and play together, you know, making it fun for them to do that, but yet understand why they're doing it. We have to think about the past because our values come from there. We must think about the present because we have to manage the assets of the trust in the present. And we have to think in the future for all of those generations who haven't been born yet, who are intended beneficiaries of the trust. So the decisions that we make have all of those aspects to it and perpetuity weighs heavily upon, upon us. The idea of perpetuity, of preserving the trust for eternity, needs to drive the management decisions. It calls for a long-range perspective and places a premium on protecting the assets granted by the ali'i.
perpetuity has collided with causes like the property rights movement. The Queen Liliuokalani Okalani Trust turned to the community and worked the halls of government to protect its land holdings. At issue was a Honolulu ordinance that allowed government to condemn land under condominiums so condo owners could purchase it. The issue there really was uh, self-determination. The ability of, of the trust to make its own decisions as to what to do with its land. The mandatory condominium leasehold conversion ordinance was repealed in 2005. A similar state law, the Land Reform Act of 1967, affecting single-family homes, remains in effect. Bishop Estate spent 17 years fighting the act, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But the court ruled the law served a legitimate public purpose, increasing the number of people who owned homes and the property they were built on. For the William Charles Lunalilo Trust, the effect was devastating. The trustees at one time developed 15 acres of the 20 acres that we own here in Hawaii Kai, and they developed it into home lots, figuring that the lease rents would support the home. And we were the first trust taken to court to test the lease law. And of course, we lost in court, and that's when leases all went up for sale, especially with the Bishop Estates lands. But ours were the first to go. We only have five acres of land now. We can't even consider that an asset anymore. It's a liability because our whole building and our, our whole plant is here. For Bishop Estate, land reform produced consequences that would shift it to a new and unexpected course. If they took the proceeds from the forest land sales and invested it in the stock market or other places, the income would jump to the extreme. And that's what happened. Their income stream went way up after they started making use of the income from the uh, condemnation. Now, the once land-rich but cash-poor estate had more cash than ever. Huge amounts of money suddenly became available to invest. The estate was not only Hawaii's largest private landowner, it became the richest charitable trust in America. And with the explosion in riches came turmoil. The upheaval within the, uh, uh, the Kamehameha School community was unprecedented. In 1997, Kamehameha alumni and parents formed Na Pua Keali'i, an organized effort to voice their concern. The schools were mismanaged, they said. Trustees refused to discuss the problems. A new plan wiped out Kamehameha's extension education programs. Weeks later, Five prominent individuals called for an investigation into the actions of the trustees. Our piece, when it was published, was really to support the people who were protesting, the students and their parents and that, that group. At the same time, the probate court had appointed attorney Colbert Matsumoto to review the estate's operations. A review, Hawahi's will, required be conducted every year. Here there was this, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar trust and what I could discern about the plans that the trust had uh, suggested that, uh, you know, the percentage of kids that were going to be served was going to actually diminish as opposed to increase. His comprehensive reports sharply criticized the mismanagement by trustees, including their dismal financial performance, which lost the estate hundreds of millions of dollars. He identified 19 specific areas where change was needed. I tried to lay a framework for reforms, which I thought were really necessary and would actually help improve the administration of the trust. Change did come, slowly and publicly. Over two years, new trustees were put in place, and the reforms Matsumoto and Napua sought were made, including how trustees were selected and compensated. As the wealth of Kamehameha schools was growing, Lunalilo Home continued to struggle to stay solvent. Initially, it was for the indigent, the poor, the sick, those in need. Um, unfortunately, our estate is not uh, in a position to do that. Therein lies the challenge, trying to balance carrying out the king's mission and at the same time, at least breaking even financially. 
That's a tough one. Bye. It's a lot of work to keep Moon Little Home open. Um, I don't want it to be my legacy that it closed during my tenure here. I want it. I want my legacy to be that it grew. And it was one of my mother's dreams was uh, as a trustee to open a daycare, adult daycare, and that never took place. So I'm happy that we now have it open now. That's going very well, and that, of course, is open to the general public. This is a very special environment. The Hawaiian spirit that's here, really the spirit of Ohana. And then what we're trying to do is to get the staff to really look at the residents as being part of a family. And that one of the other things that I like to get the staff to look at is um, really the spirit of Wakahi, you know, working in unity, but also that harmony. Hawaiian cultures and values are not different than universal values. So, and they are perpetual, so they're, they're still with us, thank goodness. Uh, what makes them Hawaiian perhaps are the way that they are expressed and lived in this place, which is Hawaii. Uh, so for us, culture is important because it keeps us in touch with those values and the way that, that we express those values, which, which are special in Hawaii. Uh, so as long as we live and live those values in the way that our ancestors did and hold to those universal values which we all hold dear, then those values will live forever and they will be imbued in our trust forever. A renewed emphasis on values and culture emerged from the restructuring at Kamehameha Schools. To again reach more students, the new trustees revived the Extension Education Division and focused on creating partnerships in the community. We know that we need to go to these students. They're in our public school system, they're in our communities, and uh, we think that's well within our mission um, to do that. We have three campuses, we have 30 some odd uh, center-based preschools, etc. But there's many others that are also working with the broader community and in turn our Hawaiian community. Department of Education is certainly one of those. Our primary goal in our predominantly Native Hawaiian communities is for long-term intergenerational change, meaning that some of our communities are challenged by many, many different issues. And really the only way to break that cycle, to support that community, to build capacity in that community, is to really focus on a longer term objective. Over the past years, 10 years or more, actually moving towards how do we reassimilate back into our own culture? Because we've lost it. And when you lose your identity, then nothing else matters. <laughs> We're really shifting paradigms. We're looking at the value of Hawaiian culture in, in terms of uh, how it is that we meet our mission. Much of our, our history has been focused on Western culture, and, and Hawaiians actually were very quite happy to send their children to Kamehameha schools to become Western. And that's largely because Hawaiians saw that as, as, as a way to survive, as a way to survive. And so now we realize that to survive, we need those senses that make us strong because how can we live in Hawaii and, and not understand who we are as, as Hawaiians? I mean, it, it would be, um, it's, it's like you're living somebody else's dreams or somebody else's reality. I believe that what we do is to uplift a people. It is not to suppress anyone, but it is to uplift a people who still today, who still today, despite so many accomplishments and so many successes and so many incredible Hawaiians in our community thriving and doing wonderful things, there are still, still so many children and families who have yet to be at the same socio, economic, and educational levels of the rest of our community. And so as long as that exists, Kamehameha Schools has a mission to remedy that. The values underlying their missions give strength to each of these institutions. In the same way, those values can help them strengthen the larger community that is their home. If 
we learn nothing else from the legacy of our king and queen is the tremendous humility they demonstrated in terms of trusting the future. We know it's a daunting task, but our king and queen would expect us to do no less. The queen always was hopeful. She never gave up hope. She was always Pona within herself, and that is something that we all strive to be and share with our children and their families so that there's always hope. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about uh, my life, which I'm, I'm living, I'm alive because of the school. It would be wonderful if we could come to a bridge that existed in the future where we could all stand, Native Hawaiian or not, and say that these institutions are now making a difference and to extend an invitation to join them on that bridge and to be part of forging Hawaii's future. Major funding for the preceding special has been provided by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, working for all Hawaiians.